All right. Um, hmm. Back again. <clears throat> For some strange reason, right? This doing this this screencasting thing is um, is actually it's turning out to be much more involving than standing in front of the class and actually interacting with it. I'm not sure why. It's probably something I'm not familiar with, I suppose. But I've been doing it for a couple of weeks now. But anyways, so we continue off with the last remaining, which is the actual EDA process. Um, this shouldn't take as long as the the quick revision we had on, um, uh, is it data preprocessing or something? Uh, I was also explaining the data set that we're working with. All right, so as part of our EDA process, um, we're doing a couple of things here. The first thing we're going to do here is just to remind ourselves of the data set we're working with, right? This has become second nature now. Uh, instead of outputting the entire contents of the data set, you can actually transport the entire contents like so. What you want to do is just take a peek at a subset of the data set which is why we're using head. And and the, the, the this whole concept or notion of head is similar to, if you just, is similar to what you have in, uh, in, in actually bash, right? So when you're working with um, shell scripts, for instance, uh, it, it'll be like similar to this, the same head command that you have here. So let's say, oh wow, head this, right? Head first record so and you have one record there so same concept anyway uh, so we, we view just two records we render them we are happy with that and then for this particular for this particular example we're looking at of this particular data set what we're saying is that the possible attributes that we could include in the EDA process in our EDA analysis right in the EDA not EDA analysis as a bit repetitive EDA process are these things here, right? Uh, and you, you notice that uh, we're deliberately filtering out things like timestamp, things like student name, student ID. These would be these are irrelevant. You probably don't need them. Maybe you might need the timestamp, but perhaps not. This is timestamp are, uh, associated with when a student actually submitted the survey form. Whether that would be important or not, I guess would be a decision left to the person doing the analysis, but I don't think it would be important in any way, right? Uh, so we're leaving out those things. So we're saying possible attributes to work with uh, hometown, major pro minor pro program, the motivations, and all these different um, different attributes, right? <clears throat> now to make our lives a lot easier, what we're saying is the first thing we do is we create a new variable that's going to represent uh, things we're going to do to, with regards to the EDA process, right? I'm just duplicating this um this particular data frame so i'm we are recreating in this particular cell cell 73 we're just recreating a new data frame by duplicating or copying the previous one we've been working with just for convenience anyway um and then because we are working with responses from last year and this year what uh I'm, i've decided to do here in this next cell is just to create a new column called year that is going to represent the year when the survey was actually uh, submitted. Uh, and the idea behind this is, uh, the thinking is that you might want to separate responses from last year and responses from this year, right? Just to visualize, to see if there's any sort of like difference or something, right? Okay, Let's just close this. <clears throat> so create a new data from code year. And then in here now, um, I just want to gain some basic, some basic understanding of the data attributes of the entire data set. It turns out that uh, uh, Pandas has a very useful tool, I mean, sorry, very useful function called describe. Whoa, let me just delete this, I want to do it before. It has a very useful function called describe, which you run on a data frame, and I'll show us just now. So if you you have a data frame like ICT 11, 10 survey, and you say dot describe, question mark. If you run this, it will show you exactly what this does, right? It generates descriptive statistics that summarize the central tendency and all these fancy things, right? Uh, be, be mindful of the fact that, or take note that all the now entries are gonna be excluded, right? So very useful. I, I, I always 
whenever I'm working with a pandas data frame, the first thing I do before I do any sophisticated graphing of bar plots and pie charts and faceted grids and whatnot, what, what I do first of all is I describe the data set, right? So I do some basic descriptive statistics. So this is what we're doing here. We're taking advantage of pandas is described data set and boom, for each field, you have all these um, different different markers here, right? So the count, uh, how many unique entries do you have? Uh, what is the top entry, right? Uh, frequencies uh, for students, right? Counts, unique. Uh, and the reason why, by the way, the student name has 55 unique entries is because we have duplicate entries for participant one. We probably have participant one for the other year as well, right? in case you're wondering, don't know, but what's happening here? Um, so, so already you can see that by just 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 running describe here, you realize that uh, you, you you have some some insight into the data set you're working with. Observe with hometown, right? Uh, count and unique entries, and then you find that the top entry is Lusaka. You already know that most of the participants clearly, or at least the, the, the most, yeah, most of the participants come from Lusaka, right? Um, minor as well. So th this this might be useful in certain instances. In certain instances, it might not be useful, right? Um, I guess we're up to you. It's a bit weird here. Yeah. I find it strange that the frequency seeing has, okay. So the weight seeing occurs three times, which is the maximum in those uh, text about what's interesting about you. All right, um, so uh, now I, I know you're probably thinking, but what's the point of this? It may not be, it may not be perhaps very useful for this particular data set, but it would definitely be useful when you work with student scores, right? If we can find the scores, I don't know where they are. If you, you, you work through the example that we said you, this sorry, the exercise that you're going to be working with. Why? Because you're working with continuous values here. So you want to gain a sense of what the average is, what the mode, what the mean is, arithmetic mean, all these fancy um, descriptive statistic statistic features that, that you'd be interested in, right? All right, uh, if we can get to the part where we're at here. So describe, very important. If I were you, I would run this every time you are, whenever you have, uh, whenever you, you find yourself wanting to go through the exploratory data analysis phase, the first thing you do is run the describe function in your data frame, right? So that you have an idea of the summary associated with the different attributes. All right, and then the first thing I do here is, remember we've just, we, we've just singled out, we're just going to single out a few, a few attributes because some of them uh, are similar, like we know that uh, text is text, irrespective of what we're dealing about me or uh, whether we're dealing with the motivation attribute, right? <clears throat> so for the minor program, what we are going to do is um, we are going to case forward, and, and I think it's repetition here. We didn't necessarily have to case forward here. The the only interesting bit here is this. We are, we are running this utility function called uh, fx of function normalizer ct minus. Now, if we go back to our utility functions, you notice that the normalizer ct minus here is just there to, to provide a, a very crude way of, of providing a mapping for the different representations of the minors. There are some people that will, will say math, who want to convert this to mathematics, for instance, right? Make sure that there's consistency. This is what we're doing here. Um, okay. I can get back to the part we were on. Okay, great. All right, so once once we, we normalize the minors, what we do here is again just do some basic summaries where I we we're just interested in trying to see what unique entries do we have associated with this field called minor program. How many entries do we have? Can we pivot these entries and just have a summary of for each entry, how many counts do we have, which is what we have in line number 10 here. So three things, get all unique entries, which are here, right? These are the all unique minor entries. And then next step is just get the unique counts. 
or just get the counts really, which is a bit redundant. You're just going to have 91 here. More importantly though is, because we expect there to be different miners, we're saying use the value count method to provide to provide a count against each of the different unique miners. So we, we know now that uh, civic education has 28 people, mathematics has 25, languages has 10, history has nine, right? Again, if you think, think about it, uh, without any graphs for now, this table will provide you some very useful information, right? Perhaps at this point, you'd be able to make a decision, important decisions, Like, do you think this, or you'd be able to decide whether this particular variable would be useful in your analysis? Uh, one of the things we've been thinking of doing is trying to come up with a classification for this particular thing. You classify these subjects based on uh, what they have in common, right? So perhaps some of these are social science, some of these are social science minors, some of them are more technical minors, right? That way you spread these numbers that are long, like one, right? Um, and already you notice that from here, you notice that there's something wrong here. There's no way this is a minor. Whoever provided this response did the wrong thing, right? So this is supposed to be their major anyway. And then more importantly, we, we graph. Remember we made mention of the fact that this EDA process is best done using plots, graphs, charts, right? Uh, so just using matplotlib here to plot all students, plot students from last year, last year's responses and this year's responses, just to see if there's any variation here, right? Um, and there's nothing fancy here. We, we, uh, uh, line number eight, nine, and 10 are the ones that are doing the plotting. Of course, the, the configuration of the plot begins at three. Um, but for me to come up with this sort of like a facet view kind of a facet grid view, what I'm doing is I'm just uh, uh, I'm just creating subplots essentially, right? Uh, and something else you notice as you're walking through this is that I'm, I'm not using matplotlib in the conventional sense. I'm actually using, I'm plotting using a data frame, right? It turns out that you can plot using a pandas data frame. That's how flexible pandas is. So observe. If I come here and say I want to plot, uh, wow. If I come here and I say I want to, not about me, so has computer access. If I if I view has computer access, you notice that I have yes, no, yes, no, right? I can say I want to plot, I can call the plot function from within the pandas data frame. That's how flexible it is. Instead of exporting this data into a format that you can later on feed to matplotlib, you can call the plot function. And then I'll say kind is uh, uh, pi. Run this. Ooh, that was weird. Hmm. Sorry about that. This is supposed to be not dot has kind. This is where it gets really tricky. Okay, not tricky, sorry. But it's supposed to be like that. Dot plot kind and still has that. Let's see what the error is. Okay. Just have to look up what's happening here. Oh, I see. So, so the thing is, I, I can't. All right, I see. So, the thing is, if I run this, um, it, so the, if you look at the result here, it's it's not going to be useful in any way. You'd have to first of all, uh, sort of like come up with a summary, right? A summary value counts. A summary that will summarize this information, and then using value counts, you can then call plot, right? Um, and then just say the kind here is going to be pie chart or something, right? And then you have a pie chart or something. So what, I'm, what I was trying to say here is trying to showcase is that um, <clears throat> the, the line number eight all the way up to 10 are not directly making use of matplotlib, but we are plotting on or making plotting using pandas, essentially. So you can plot using pandas. 
The other alternative would be to use the output that you have here. Perhaps, uh, let's see if we can do this. Anyway, so you, you, can, you can plot this using, uh, so, oh, sorry. You have your value counts, right? And then you would say, you have these values here, you could say dot to list or something so that you have a list and right you have a list uh, and hopefully you'd know if whether or, or it gets to dict or something is that to dict or something oh, it's a series okay so what i was trying to do is i was we were confusing things here i was trying to see if i could export if i could convert this into a list or something and then plot using the conventional way but the key takeaway point here is you can you can actually plot in fact you can say plot.py here right you can you can plot using pandas by just chaining the function. This is what I'm doing here, right? This is what we're doing here. Uh, the only interesting thing, uh, the only other interesting thing we're doing here is we are plotting all these things. We are simulating like a facet, a facet or a grid of sorts, right? Where we plot all the students, students from last last year's responses and this year's responses. All right, um, you probably want to look up these things uh, just so you are familiar with some of these tricks. And then the other thing we are doing is we are interested in plotting whether or not they took computer studies as an elective. Uh, again, I, I do the same thing as I did up there where I, I get unique entries, right? I also count the entries, which is 91. So unique will give me yes or no. Count, and then I get the value count. So essentially a summary, an aggregate of all the different unique entries here each how many are no's how many are yeses right this is what i have again by looking at this i have an idea of what the distribution is like this is the whole point this is one of the reasons why you go through an idea process right uh you're exploring the data describing it in part again same thing as i did up there only this time around i'm instead of plotting a horizontal bar plot or horizontal bar plots i've decided because i have yes and no i have decided to say Representation using a pie chart is appropriate. So again, I plot all students. I see that the distribution is more or less the same, right? And at this stage, really, uh, I, I, I would wager, right? I would, and let's say the distribution for the numbers. By just looking at the, by, by looking at the, um, this graph, I know that it won't really be very helpful for me to incorporate this particular attribute in my analysis. Why? because I have very few people, most of the students, most of the students in class did not take computer studies as an elective. So if most of them didn't, then it's pointless for me to include this in my analysis. Right, the power of EDA process. I've already determined that using, using this to determine whether or not it has an influence on the overall outcome of what I'm searching for, what I'm interested in assessing, is not going to be helpful because the vast majority of the observations are no's, right? This only works if you have an even distribution or a distribution that has that makes sense. So the data is not enough for me to be able to use this as a variable essentially. All right, uh, and then in terms of uh, experience working with computers, now this is somewhat different because this is represented using a Likert-like scale, right, on a scale of one to five. Uh, so we're interested in finding out how many had experience working with computers, again, I'm doing the same thing, I get unique entries. So I know that the Likert scale I was working with was no experience, one to two, or no experience less than one year, one to two, three to five, and more than five. By looking at this table, I see that the vast majority of students uh, have less than, have no experience working with computers actually. Less or less, less than one year working with computers or one, or no experience at, at all. Now, again, this is, issue of uh, how the survey was phrased I suppose um, students have at this stage they, are, they had not yet been introduced to what the definition of the computer right the vast majority of them actually do have computers uh, if people want to play around with more data sets by the way I have more data sets that, that we've collected as part of uh, the undergraduate courses that we oppose for a little while undergraduate courses that we work with so we did a COVID survey Right, where we're trying to find out, um, uh, we're trying to find out if our students have access to devices, 
Now, if I look at the responses for the first years, with a lot of them, hopefully, you notice that, uh, come on, come on, 38 responses, it's not a lot. If I go down to the 38 responses, most of them have a smartphone, right? So I guess what I'm trying to say is, if you look at this, the reason why most of them have, say, we're saying no experience working with computers is their view of what a computer is, is like a desktop computer, or a laptop or something, right? They don't view a smartphone as being a computer, but that's besides the point. So uh, because of the nature of the data here, I've just decided to say, I'm going to use a horizontal bar plot to just simulate the it like scale, right? Again, you notice that looking at the table alone is not helping trying to identify a pattern that might exist, but rather using a visual representation is much easier, right? And already here, I can I can make interesting, interesting, uh, interesting decisions. Like because I see that uh, segmenting the res segmenting these this particular attribute the attribute into five separate uh, categories or ordinal values may not be helpful. What I would decide to do is just say, well, maybe I'll I'll just say I'll consider those without experience and those with experience lump those with experience into one and those without experience into one then i would have a reasonable data set to work with which is properly petitioned right again i'm able to make this decision because i'm undergoing an eda process right visually representing this data um and then finally uh i i go through an eda process by looking at texture data right and really for textual data, what I'm interested in doing is just visualizing the data using a word cloud, right? So if you remember this input import statement here, right? This statement number 13 here, this was done so that we could generate this word cloud. Uh, I almost always use a word cloud for textual input because it, it helps me identify patterns associated with my data, right? So if I was, if I, if I was to, maybe uh, try and decide whether this would be used as input into my analysis. I would look at some of these prominent words. Is something like develop or technology, is this going to be helpful or something? Essentially what this field was asking them is what, and I don't have to think, I can go to the actual question actually. So if I go here and I go to program motivation, I'll show you exactly how it was phrased. So the question was, what made you decide on your program? No. What made you decide to pursue the program itself? Right. So this is the motivation. So some prominent words that came out of the open-ended statement are things like computer. So maybe people are interested in technology. People are interested in computers. Right. People are interested in knowledge or becoming something. Right. Um, at this stage, I really wouldn't know if the text representation of that text would be helping in any way. Probably not really. Um, but if you're uncertain, fear not. I mean, there's, a, there's another process that we discussed very soon, so-called feature selection process, where we'll be able to determine whether this is worth incorporating into the overall analysis, right? All right, so hopefully this quick uh, walkthrough of the EDA process is going to help you play around with the Jupyter Notebook um, and, and really be able to do something similar with the mini project that you're working towards. Great, and then uh, I'll just end here and then I'll create another segment of the screencast to just quickly revise on the data set that I strongly encourage you use to practice. It's an exercise, it's tagged as an exercise, but uh, it's option obviously, but it would be nice if you actually work through this because subsequent merging of data, once we look at data transformation, is going to involve data set number one and number two and other data sets as well. <clears throat> All right.